Welcome to the High Grow video series. Introduction to indoor growing is divided into three parts. In part one, we will learn how plants grow. In part two, we will learn how to design and build an indoor garden. In part three, we will learn about the various tasks that the grower must perform. So roll up a fatty, sit back and enjoy. Plants favor an appropriately textured grow medium. The medium contains water and nutrients. Roots anchor the plant within the grow medium and absorb the water and nutrients. The stem holds up the leaves and flowers and transports food and water up and down to different parts of the plant. The leaves act as solar panels collecting sunlight and through the process of photosynthesis converts sunlight, nutrient-rich water, and carbon dioxide into carbohydrates and oxygen. As a plant matures, it flowers and becomes either male or female. Male flowers pollinate the female flowers and the females develop seeds that will soon fall to the ground as the plant slowly dies. Of the many seeds that fall to the ground, some will survive and germinate next springtime. This is how marijuana grows in its natural environment. Marijuana grows naturally in many parts of the world. Strains from warm places like Mexico, Jamaica, Africa, or the Middle East are usually called sativa. Sativas have evolved to suit climates with long, warm grow seasons. They are characterized by long, thin leaf blades and grow relatively tall. Strains that are adapted to colder climates with shorter grow seasons, such as parts of the US, Canada, or Europe, are called indica or indican. Indicas have wider leaf blades and don't grow as tall. Indoor growers almost exclusively prefer indica strains because they flower much quicker than sativas. Quick flowering plants allow for more frequent harvests and are less prone to disease than plants needing longer to mature. Seeds can be purchased from mail-order companies in Canada and Europe. These companies offer a huge selection of well-known and not-so-well-known strains, ranging in price from $30 to over $150 for 10 seeds. Seed companies allow the grower to start with reliable, high-quality, trait-specific strains. However, some seed companies have better reputations than others. Deal with a reputable company that has existed for at least a year or two just to be safe. Seeds found mixed in with retailed marijuana can often produce buds just as good as those in which they were found, but not always. Some seeds found in retailed pot are the result of a hermaphrodite plant in the grow room. If so, the seeds may also have hermaphrodite tendencies. Unless the grower has no other choice, the use of mystery seeds should be avoided. Using clones from fellow growers is another good way to start a crop. More on cloning later. Seeds can be sprouted different ways. Many growers like to germinate seeds in dampened paper towels. Simply planting them an inch deep in moist potting soil should also work fine. Use a tray with a moisture dome to trap humidity if necessary and keep the soil moist. Never place seed trays on cold cement surfaces. Keep them at room temperature or several degrees warmer if possible. A sprout should emerge in about three to four days. Most seeds have about a 90% germination rate. In a group of 10 seeds, nine should germinate. If seeds do not germinate, it could be that they have been damaged or are poor seeds, but may also be the result of grower error. Make sure the medium in which the seed is planted remains moistened, but not waterlogged. First, the cotyledon leaves will appear, 
and then sets of the more recognizable serrated edged leaves will appear. A seedling will need two or three weeks, or maybe longer, to establish enough roots and leaves so that it can begin to grow rapidly. After about a month, when the plant has developed enough roots, the plant will begin rapid growth. This is called the vegetative, or vegetation stage. During this time, plants consume great deals of nitrogen, gain height, and grow many branches and leaves. Growers control the length of the vegetation phase based on how large they want their plants to grow. Some growers like to keep the phase short and harvest many small plants. Others prefer to wait longer and grow fewer plants but much larger. A short vegetation period is two or three weeks. A long vegetation period is four or more weeks. A plant could be vegetated for months and months, perhaps years, but this is not practical for the grower. After plants vegetate for a while, budding can begin. Budding, flowering, and blooming all mean the same thing. During this time, flowers become dense and form cola buds at the tops of branches. Sticky resins high in THC begin to coat the surface of leaves. For most indican strains, budding takes seven to eight weeks. For sativa strains, a little longer. After that time, buds are fully mature and ready for harvest. Growing indoors from seed to harvest, the plant life cycle should be about 100 days or three to four months. The amount of light a plant receives each day is called the photo period. During seedling and vegetative growth, the plants will be given 18 hours of light and six hours of darkness. Using a steady timer so that the daily photo period remains consistent is important. Some growers will vegetate their plants under continuous 24-hour light, with no six-hour dark period claiming that plants will utilize the extra light. However, most growers claim that any more than 18 hours of light per day is unnecessary and a waste of electricity. In order to induce budding, the photo period is changed to 12 hours light and 12 hours of darkness. This simulates the shorter days of late summer, convincing plants that it is time to bud. To bud plants, or to put them into bud, means simply to change from the vegetative photo period to the budding photo period, thereby inducing the change. The budding photo period is used until plants are harvested. Growers make this change when plants reach a certain size. This should be done when they are two-thirds of the overall size the grower wants them to be at harvest. Some growers prefer to grow plants very large, others prefer them small. Growing plants large allows the grower to harvest more bud from each plant, but the growth cycle takes longer. Harvesting smaller plants usually means more plants are needed to fill the grow area, but the growth cycle is much shorter. Seedlings should have enough size and foliage to support buds before they are shifted from veg to bud. Make sure that plants are never exposed to any light during daily dark periods for the entire duration of the budding phase. The number of plants in a garden is not a useful measure of how much bud can be grown. It depends more on how much light is provided. Many serious growers will have two separate grow rooms, one for vegging and one for budding. After plants are done vegging, they are moved to the bud room, and a second batch of babies is started in the veg room again. This system allows the grower to harvest more frequently and optimize the use of space. Bud rooms are larger than veg rooms to accommodate the increase in plant size. As well, many growers will use metal halide light in the veg room and high pressure sodium light in the bud room. Marijuana is dioecious. That means there are both male and female plants. The sex of a plant does not become evident until well into the vegetation stage. Male flowers produce pollen. When this pollen comes into contact with the female flower, the female becomes pollinated and then produces seeds from the DNA of each parent. 
Nail plants present a challenge to growers because they are generally unwanted. Only the female plant produces the sought-after buds high in THC, males do not. Furthermore, female buds are far, far better if they remain unpollinated by the males because then they won't develop seeds. Only pure, smokable bud. So male plants are not only of little use other than for breeding, they are actually a threat to the potential of female buds. That is why growers remove males from the garden before they have a chance to pollinate the females. The sex of a plant will become evident shortly before or after budding is induced. There is only a small window of opportunity after a male shows its sex and before it sheds its pollen. Keeping a careful eye on the garden is important so that no male pollen sacs are allowed to develop. Even before budding begins, each plant should be inspected every few days for signs of maleness. As soon as a male plant is identified, it should be removed from the garden. Males will grow pollen sacs. Often the pollen sacs will develop into clusters. Although some growers may use male plants to make small amounts of hash or oil, most growers throw them away because there is so little THC to be had from them. Whereas males are identified by their pollen sacs, females can be identified by sets of white hairs. Because well-developed male plants use up valuable time and growth space, serious growers prefer to eliminate the problem altogether by using female clones. A clone is a small clipping from an adult plant that will quickly grow its own roots and grow into a mature plant like that from a seed. The clipping will have the same genetics as the parent plant it was taken from. Taking clippings from a female plant will mean all the clippings are female as well. Clones should be taken from a plant when it is vegetating, not when it is budding. A grower could either take several clones from one designated mother plant that remains forever in the vegetative stage, or else take one or two clippings of each plant from a group of plants that are about to be forced to bud. Either way, it must be known that the parent source of the clone is, in fact, female. A problem arises, however, because a clone must only be taken from a plant before it flowers, and yet we can't know that a plant is female until after it flowers. There are two ways to deal with this inconvenience. One way to determine whether a plant is female is to force it into bud until its sex shows, and then quickly revert it back to the vegetative stage. A budding plant will slowly revert back to vegetation if put back into a long light cycle. However, forcing a plant to bud and then reverting it back to vegetation places undue stress on a plant. A better method is to take a clone from the plant in question and force the clone to bud until its sex shows. The parent plant will be the same sex as the clone. The clone is good for little else and can be thrown away. Here we see a clone being taken. First he covers the razor edge with rooting hormone. He chooses a sturdy branch and cuts halfway between two sets of branch nodes. The cut is made on an angle so there is more surface area where the stem has been cut, allowing more roots to grow out. Extra leaves and branches are cut off so that it is a long stem. Rooting hormone is dripped into the rock wool cube as the clone is inserted. The cube is gently squeezed to get rid of air pockets. While he keeps them in a tray with an inch of water, in a moisture dome, under fluorescent light, they are misted daily. 
This one here is two weeks old. This one here, less than one week. The key to a successful grow room is to emulate nature as closely and favorably as possible. Rain, wind, light, and darkness are all important conditions of nature that must be recreated in the grow room. Temperature and humidity must also be carefully controlled. The equipment essential for building a grow room includes grow lights, fans, timers, and a thermometer. Reflective hoods for light systems and reflective plastic for walls and ceilings and other building materials may also be necessary. Indoor gardens should be carefully designed so that space and light can be utilized efficiently and so maintenance is minimal. Keep in mind that lots of water will be needed in the garden and that messy runoff will be common. Also, fans can usually be heard through fully insulated walls and large crops will produce strong odors. If noise and odor are an issue, then gardens should be designed accordingly. Walls can be doubly insulated, or baffle boxes can be used for loud fans. Sophisticated filtering devices get rid of odors. Using basements, back rooms, sheds, and garages may also help isolate sounds and odors. Grow lights create a lot of heat, which is often hard to control during summer months. This makes basements a popular location for grow rooms and houses without air conditioning. Grow rooms should be clean and sterile. Drapes, fabrics, and anything not needed should be removed from the grow area. Carpets can harbor dampness, dust, and bugs, and may generally get ruined if they are not removed or covered. Vapor barrier or reflective plastic can be used to line wood and carpeted floors. Troughs or trays help contain inevitable runoff water. An indoor garden could be as small as a cupboard or as large as an entire basement. Most growers prefer to use an enclosed area for the garden. This keeps odors, sound and light contained and allows for easier control over temperature and humidity. Light is probably the most important factor in crop yield potential. More light means more bud. Generally, when growing indoors, a grower could harvest the same amount of bud by growing 10 plants as he could by growing 50 plants, assuming the same amount of light is used. That is to say that the number of plants grown is not a good measure of crop potential when growing indoors. Crop potential is determined foremost by the amount of light that is used. Common household incandescent and halogen lamps are inappropriate for plants. Inexpensive incandescent bulbs marketed as grow lights are also very poor for marijuana. Growers may use fluorescent lights for clones and young seedlings, but using fluorescent light for older plants is not recommended. For vegetative and flowering growth, Growers need to use HIDs, high intensity discharge lamps. These lamps may be the largest investment item for the grow room, but quite essential for good yields and quite worth it. Growers use two types of HID, metal halide and high pressure sodium. Both come in various wattages, typically 400, 600 and 1000. The higher the wattage, the more electricity it consumes and the brighter the light is. Brightness is measured in lumens. Bulbs will have a lumen output rating. This rating is the best indication of its brightness. The amount of light to be used should govern the size of the grow room. A low wattage lamp will be more effective in the small room than it will be in a large room because reflective walls will contain the light and keep it concentrated. High wattage lamps, on the other hand, are wasted in small rooms. 
This chart shows the approximate areas the lamps of different wattages will cover. A 250 watt lamp will cover 5 to 12 square feet, about the area of a small closet. A 400 watt lamp will cover 8 to 20 square feet. A 600 watt lamp will cover 12 to 30 square feet. A 1000 watt lamp will cover 20 to 50 square feet, about half the size of a small bedroom. While a 250 watt lamp is well suited for a small closet, a large full basement could easily utilize several 1000 watt lamps. Of course, the more light provided, the bigger your buds will be. Experienced growers can produce up to a pound of fully dried marijuana for each 1000 watt lamp used every three to four months. Hydroponic growers produce even more. Metal halides emit light similar to that of natural sunlight. This makes them ideal as grow lights. Metal halides are especially good during vegetation. High pressure sodium lamps emit a visibly yellow orangish light. Because this light lacks slightly in the bluish end of the color spectrum, plants vegetated under high pressure sodium light tend to stretch slightly between branches and appear overly leggy. However, a high pressure sodium lamp will produce about 30% more light than a metal halide of the same wattage. Many growers will mix both types of light. Others use metal halide light for vegetative growth and high pressure sodium for flowering. This emulates the manner in which sunlight becomes increasingly reddish orange towards the end of summer. If you plan to use only one lamp, most growers will recommend a high pressure sodium for its superior lumen output, but either one will do fine on its own. A ballast is part of the HID lamp system, and all HID lamps require one. An HID lamp will not fit into a regular household light socket. 1000 watt HIDs will usually need to be on their own exclusive electrical circuit. Using other electrical devices on the same circuit may cause circuit fuses to blow. A 1000 watt lamp plus the wattage of the ballast, which is about 30 watts, runs at about 8.5 amps. On a 15 amp circuit, that leaves only 6.5 amps more that can be drawn before the fuse is overloaded. Amateur growers should be advised that the use of multiple 1000 watt lamps will result in a marked increase in one's daily electricity consumption. In places where growing marijuana is illegal, suspicious electricity consumption may be the telltale sign of a grow operation. To determine the cost of running an HID, first determine the cost of electricity by checking your last electricity bill. Electric companies charge by the kilowatt hour. This is the cost for the amount of electricity used to run a 1000 watt appliance for one hour. The price of electricity is generally anywhere between 5 and 15 cents per kilowatt hour. Use this formula. If the cost of electricity is 8 cents per kilowatt hour, and you run a 400 watt lamp for 18 hours, it should cost about 57 cents. Wise growers are cautious and uncompromising when it comes to proper wiring and safe electrical setups. Any metal fixtures such as reflective hoods should be properly grounded. Never put a fuse with an amperage rating higher than 15 into a 15 amp circuit. This will start a fire. It is wise to use a reflective hood with your lamp. Utilizing every bit of light as possible will contribute to a larger yield. Upward bound light is wasted unless it is properly reflected directly onto the plants. Plan how you will position your lamp and use an appropriate reflective hood or construct reflective surfaces. Keep your lights close to your plants. This will ensure the plants receive the most intense bright light. 200 and 400 watt lamps should be kept about one foot away from plants, whereas 1000 watt lamps should be kept a little further away, around 15 to 30 inches. Many growers suspend the lamp and reflective hood on an adjustable cord. As plants grow taller, the lamp is simply raised. Alternately, risers can be used to achieve the same effect with lights that are stationary. 
If lights are too far away from plants, plants will grow tall but with very few branches or leaves. Use proper reflective plastic on the inside walls of the grow area or paint them flat white. This, like using a reflective hood, will help save potentially wasted light by reflecting it back onto the plants. Non-reflective surfaces waste light by changing it into heat. Another important element to a successful indoor garden is proper air ventilation. Plants need a constant supply of carbon dioxide and moderate temperatures. Without an air exchange system, carbon dioxide levels in the grow room air will become depleted and lights will cause excessive heat buildup. A lack of CO2 or excessive heat will cause plants to suffer. Devices that provide supplemental CO2 can help plants a great deal, but your garden will still require a regular intake of fresh air and removal of stale air. An effective ventilation system will also help contain and direct offensive odors. Design your indoor garden with airflow in mind. An enclosed area, or a room, is best so that there can be forced air movement. Place an air intake vent close to the floor on one side of the room, and an exhaust vent near or on the ceiling close to the other side of the room. This system is the best way to remove stale air as well as heat buildup caused by HIDs. The intake vent should bring in air from the outside or from a different room. Exhaust air should be directed so that it will not re-enter the room. Install an inline or squirrel cage fan adjacent to the exhaust vent or ducting to create airflow. Installing an additional fan on the intake vent will make airflow even better. If only one fan is used for ventilation, it should be used on the exhaust. This will suck air out of the room and create a negative pressure in the grow room discouraging unwanted odors from seeping out any other way but by the exhaust vent. Always use fans of sufficient strength. The CFM rating of a fan will indicate how many cubic feet of air a fan is supposed to push in one minute. Long ducts with curves make fans less efficient than their CFM rating. Use a fan that will change the entire volume of air in your grow room in about five minutes or less. Ventilation systems can be designed without actually cutting holes in walls or ceilings. A fan on the floor can easily lead to a window on the other side of some plastic or even down the hall to another room. However, cutting a small hole near the top or bottom of a door may be the only way to get fresh air into a small area such as a closet without actually leaving the door open. Some closets have trap doors on their ceilings that lead to attic space. Fitting a small exhaust fan to the trap door opening makes ventilation easy. Air is sucked into the attic and pulled into the closet from around the edges of the closet door. Most growers need to be concerned about odor control. Maturing crops will produce smells that some may find offensive. For small closet sized gardens, directing exhaust air somewhere that it will not be detected might be enough. With the additional help of sprays or other odor masking agents, the smell is not a problem. Other growers prefer a higher level of odor control. Growers have used ozone generators as effective odor removers for years. Ozone alters the molecular structure of microorganisms that carry smells. While ozone generators can be quite effective, they are generally not cheap. Also, maintenance may be troublesome and some types require secondary air mixing chambers to be built in the ductwork. A wise alternative to ozone generators are carbon filters. Like ozone generators, carbon filters are not cheap, but they are easy to install and to use. Carbon filters are attached to the exhaust fan. The filter is placed anywhere inside the room and, before exiting the room, all exhaust air passes through the charcoal material inside the filter, at which point most of the smell becomes neutralized. 
Good carbon filters range in price from under $200 to over $600. Each should have specifications indicating how much space it can effectively cover, as well as performance requirements for the fan to be attached. Carbon filters have surpassed ozone generators in popularity because of their effectiveness and simplicity. If minimizing the smell is a priority concern, all exhaust air, pre-filtered or not, should be carefully monitored and directed away from areas where it may be detected, especially during the last several weeks before harvest. In addition to intake and outtake airflow, oscillating fans should be placed in the garden to blow air directly onto plants to stir leaves and sway stalks. This emulates the natural breeze of the outdoors and performs two main functions. Firstly, the constant pressure of the wind causes the trunks and branches of the plant to become strong and sturdy. This will help immensely in late bloom when the branches are carrying the weight of large, dense buds. Secondly, a swift breeze helps keep plants free of dust and bugs. Dust can clog up the surface of leaves, making it difficult for them to function. Most bugs are a nuisance to marijuana. Some are devastating. Constant air movement makes an unhappy home for bugs. Proper ventilation should keep the temperature and humidity in check. The relative humidity should stay between 40 and 60 percent. Unless you live in an extremely dry or extremely humid climate, humidity shouldn't be an issue. If it is a problem, simply use a humidifier or dehumidifier. HID lamps will cause a great deal of heat. A hot lamp will begin to raise the temperature of a room immediately. But, it is very important to maintain a favorable temperature in the grow room. Keep it between 70 and 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Mid to high 70s is the best. At night, when the lights go off, it's okay for the temperature to drop 10 or 15 degrees, but not much more. Extreme temperatures will slow plant growth and may encourage bugs and disease. If your lights are causing too much heat buildup, then you need to increase your ventilation. Extreme temperatures will slow plant growth and may encourage bugs and disease. In hot climates or during the summer, many growers use air conditioners. Using an appropriately textured grow medium is important so that roots can grow fast and strong. Roots need access to plenty of water, but grow mixes that retain water for too long may lock out air. Air is also important for roots. Using a light fluffy grow mix that can hold water well but quickly drains excess water is best. Use either store-bought potting soil or better yet store-bought soilless mix. Soilless mixes are made up of peat moss, perlite, and vermiculite, and are ideal. All three ingredients are common in all garden stores and inexpensive. Peat moss holds water well but may become too dense and acidic after repeated watering if used on its own. Perlite and vermiculite help lighten dense peat moss, providing pockets for air and water. Store-bought soilless mixes are usually pH balanced with lime. These mixtures are perfect for marijuana and are usually more fluffy than potting soils. Light fluffy mixes are better than heavy mixes but will need to be watered more often. If you need to mix your own, use one part peat moss and one part perlite. Or else mix equal parts of each peat moss, perlite and vermiculite. Such homemade mixes will require a small amount of fine dolomite lime to moderate pH levels. Potting soil mixes available from garden stores often contain fertilizer. Such fertilizer will be consumed by fast-growing marijuana within a few weeks. Also, these mixtures are not optimized for marijuana growth. For these reasons, grow mixes with no nutritional content are preferred. This removes any unnecessary guesswork. Most soilless mixes contain no fertilizer. 
All is applied after the fact by the grower. This method is easy and often cheaper than buying soils fortified with fertilizer. Some growers are tempted to mix up potting soils from garden patches in their backyard or dirt from underneath their lawn. This is a very bad idea. Pathogens, disease and other plant health risks are introduced this way. Store-bought soilless mix is sterilized before packaging for this very reason. Also, once a grow medium has been used, it should be discarded. Never use recycled potting soil or soilless mix in an indoor garden. Marijuana grown under HIDs with proper nutrition will grow very fast and require lots of water. As plants grow older, their need for water increases. Most growers will water their plants every two to three days. The rule of thumb for watering plants is to fully saturate the entire grow medium and water again only after the grow medium is dried out substantially. Grow medium that does not dry out enough may lock out oxygen. This hampers root performance and slows plant growth. Grow mediums that remain too dry for too long cause plants to dehydrate. Dehydrated plants are easy to spot. Leaves and branches become limp and hang straight down. Dehydrated plants will quickly recover if a good watering is provided soon enough. However, such stress may hamper a plant's overall growth and should be prevented. If plants ever show any signs of dehydration, then watering is being done far too infrequent. The grower must also make sure that the entire grow medium is watered evenly. Often, when growing in pots, the grow medium will harden up and contract, causing the top layer to harden and leaving an open gap along the inside wall of the pot. This causes water to drain through the pot without actually penetrating the soil. By cultivating the top layer, Filling in the gap along the outside of the pot and pouring water over the grow medium slowly, this problem is solved. Most soilless mixes contain a wetting agent. This helps water penetrate the soil evenly so there are no dry pockets. A small drop of dish soap in a bucket of water will have the same effect. Enough water should be provided so that the entire grow medium is saturated and a small amount drains from the bottom of the pot. Plants need to be misted also. Misting water onto leaves simulates rain and helps clean leaf surfaces of dirt and dust. This can be done once every few days or at the grower's leisure, but is probably best done shortly before or after the lights go on so that excess moisture will dry up in the warmth. Be careful not to spray water onto a hot HID bulb, as this may cause it to crack. Generally, most tap water is fine for marijuana. Make sure the water is not extremely cold or extremely hot. The chlorine present in most drinking water does not seem to have any adverse effects on marijuana growth. Though some growers leave tap water in an open container for a day, so that the chlorine will evaporate. Some water, like that pumped from a well, is softened with saline additives. Salt treated water is bad for plants and should not be used. Some tap water will have inappropriate pH levels as well. Check the pH of your water and make sure it is between 6 and 8. Commercially available pH adjuster can be added to the water to adjust its pH. Water is also used to periodically flush the soil of any salt buildup. Salt buildup is usually caused by chemical fertilizers that are left over in the soil or from water that is softened using salt. Using non saline water and not overfeeding are the best ways of avoiding salt buildup. If the grow medium does incur a salt buildup, it will become a toxic environment for the roots, and they will be unable to perform. This can be a serious problem for unsuspecting amateur growers because it may cause plants to look like they are not getting enough fertilizer, but only because the roots are not absorbing it. 
Growers using chemical fertilizers should flush the soil once or twice each crop, just to be sure that salt buildup doesn't occur. Flushing more often won't hurt. Flushing or leaching is really just an extreme watering. Use about two to three times as much water as there is grow medium and slowly pour it over the pot. The drainage will contain most of the unused salt residues from the grow medium. Different growers use different methods to fertilize their plants. Grow mediums like store-bought potting soils generally contain fertilizer. Others like most soilless mixes on the other hand usually do not. When adding fertilizer to a grow medium it is sometimes mixed in from the beginning before the plant is planted or else water-soluble fertilizer is applied when the plant gets watered. Also, the grower has the choice between chemical or organic fertilizers. Many growers use a combination of feeding methods. But, for the amateur indoor gardener, it is highly recommended to use a store-bought or custom blended soilless mix made of peat moss, perlite and vermiculite that is devoid of any nutrients and apply simple, inexpensive chemical fertilizer that is mixed with water and poured over the grow medium. This method is cheap and easy, allows the grower to have total control over fertilizer content, and is ideal for optimum plant growth. Store-bought potting soils that are fortified with fertilizer, often time-release fertilizers, should be avoided because they just complicate things by adding extra guesswork. If desired, the grower can use organic fertilizer instead, but it may not be as easy. Whereas chemical fertilizers are highly concentrated liquids or powder crystals, organic fertilizers are bulky concoctions made of manures, guanos, fish carcass, bone meal, blood meal, and so on. Organic fertilizers are not as clean and easy to work with as chemical fertilizers are, especially when gardening indoors. They also require more knowledge to use and may emit foul odors. However, Organic growers claim that organically grown plants produce a sweeter and cleaner smoke product in the end. Regardless, both types can produce grade A bud, and most consumers probably cannot tell any difference. The list of nutrients that a plant requires includes nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium, manganese, boron, zinc, sulfur, iron, molybdenum, and copper. Nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium are considered the important primary nutrients, and marijuana consumes a great deal of all three, especially nitrogen. The rest are considered secondary and trace elements. These nutrients are needed only in smaller amounts. Fertilizer packages are always labeled with three numbers. Organic fertilizers usually have low numbers whereas highly concentrated chemical fertilizers have higher numbers. These numbers refer to the percentage of each of the primary nutrients contained in the fertilizer. A mixture labeled 15-30-10 is 15% nitrogen, 30% phosphorus, and 10% potassium. The more concentrated a fertilizer is, the more it will need to be watered down. Different proportions of these three nutrients are suitable for different stages of growth. Check the small print to see if the product contains secondary and trace elements, and what they are and how much. Most fertilizers contain the full range of secondary and trace elements. Some do not. Most growers alternate between watering and watering with fertilizer. Water is applied every couple days or as often as needed. Every second or third watering, a dosage of fertilizer is given. When signs of over-fertilization occur, dosages are too high. Leaf tips become burnt and often curl under. Severe over-fertilization can cause drastic results, but may take a few days to show up. Amateur growers need to be patient and show restraint.
Experimenting with control groups and keeping detailed records may help the grower determine optimal fertilizer dosages. Young seedlings will not consume great deals of fertilizer. Some growers use special nutrient additives or growth hormone to stimulate root growth in early stages. Such additives may help hasten growth slightly but are not essential. A moderate dose of all-purpose 20-20-20 once a week for the first couple weeks should be fine to satisfy the plant's needs. After a few weeks, a seedling will begin fast vegetative growth and begin to consume lots of nitrogen. Use the same general purpose fertilizer or one similar, but slightly higher in nitrogen. During vegetative growth, there should always be at least as much nitrogen in the fertilizer as either phosphorus or potassium. Apply fertilizer once every second or third watering. During the last seven to eight weeks, during budding, Marijuana consumes mostly phosphorus and relatively little nitrogen or potassium. Use a blooming fertilizer high in phosphorus and low in nitrogen. Too much nitrogen during budding will encourage unwanted foliage. Again, apply fertilizer once every second or third watering. During the last 10 to 14 days before harvest, no fertilizer should be applied to plants. Instead, flush plants with pure water only. This will minimize the presence of residual fertilizer compounds that affect the burning qualities of fully dried bud. Transplanting is a logical method for saving space when plants are small and providing increased root space for plants as they grow larger. Seedlings can be kept in small 5 to 10 inch pots. This will allow room for many seedlings and make watering and feeding less wasteful than starting seedlings in large pots. However, a growing plant should never be left in a pot that is too small. Plants that become overly root bound experience stress become inhibited, and may even flower prematurely. Gently popping a root mass out from its pot will reveal if the roots need more space or not. A dense network of yellowish-white roots covering the entire outside of the root mass indicates that more growth space is needed for roots. Plants should be transplanted before such a dense network develops. Growers who start seedlings in small 5 to 10 inch pots will need to transplant them after about a month or more to bigger multi-gallon containers where they can remain. Any container type can be used as long as it is clean and it has holes in the bottom to drain water. Use a pot that will contain a gallon or two of grow medium for each foot of plant growth expected. To transplant, soak the entire grow medium with water and then wait for 10 minutes as excess water drains. During this time, prepare the new, larger pot by filling it up two-thirds or so with grow medium. When the plant is ready, place one hand over the soil with the plant stalk between your fingers and gently invert the plant and then lift up the pot from the root mass and gently place it into the new pot. Fill the edges with grow medium, pack it softly and re-water the entire thing. Keeping the indoor garden clean and tidy is key in preventing bug infestations and disease. Dead leaves should be removed from plants and taken out of the grow room. Water runoff should be mopped up from the floor and dirt and dust should also be wiped up. Growers who use reflective plastic on walls, ceilings and floors have a quick and easy time keeping surfaces clean. Mopping and scrubbing with a light bleach solution every now and then is a good way to promote a sterile environment unfavorable for mold, fungus, bugs and disease. Avoid letting lower leaves rest on pots or the grow medium. This will encourage diseases like common blight to find its way onto plants. 
Grow room hygiene is an essential ingredient to a healthy, abundant harvest. Spider mites are a grower's nightmare, and probably the most common pest faced by indoor growers. Most mite infestations are the result of poor ventilation, high temperatures, or unhygienic conditions. Good forced air circulation and oscillating fans to constantly blow on leaves and create air movement will help discourage mites. Keeping the air below 75 degrees will also discourage them. Avoid letting pets into the grow room and never enter the grow room wearing clothes that may have come in contact with other plants, especially house plants. Simple homemade or store-bought soap and water concoctions can be sprayed on leaves to suppress minor bug infestations. Spray the underside of leaves where mites live. More serious cases may necessitate other insecticides. Different products are available for different pests. Predator insects, such as ladybugs, are sometimes used to consume mites. Most growers avoid using insecticides that are not designed for plants bound for consumption. For a simple homemade light-duty mite insecticide, mix a teaspoon of dish soap into a jug of water and spray onto the undersides of leaves. A higher concentration of soap can be used, but may require a follow-up rinse with pure water the next day to remove soap residue. Soap sprays should not be used on buds. There are two common types of mold that growers watch out for. White powder mold that appears on the surface of leaves can occur any time during a plant's life and is usually the result of high humidity or from excessively cold water sprayed onto leaves. Black and gray mold is also caused by high humidity but usually occurs late in the growth cycle when flower clusters become increasingly dense. This type of mold is harder to detect because it begins deep within the leaf clusters before spreading. Black and gray molds will also occur where stalks have been cut or damaged. Much of the dried marijuana product will not develop until the last two weeks before harvest. Buds should not be harvested too early or too late. Signs that a plant is ready for harvest are when white hairs turn brownish red and when flowers are not getting denser anymore. When the majority of the white hairs on a plant have turned to brownish red, the plant is ready for harvest. Some plants will mature sooner than others. Flowers on the tops of plants will be larger and denser and may mature sooner than those underneath. Growers often harvest top branches before harvesting those on the bottom. Leaving a mature plant for too long is dangerous because mold becomes a bigger threat as buds grow more dense. Use pruning shears to cut branches down. Harvested marijuana should be trimmed then dried. Trimming is much easier if done immediately after harvesting before leaves become dead and limp. Removing large fan leaves and trimming extruding leaf tips from around the buds will allow the grower to separate the potent and not so potent parts of the plant. Leaf tips are often used to make oil, hash or similar substances. Marijuana can be dried any number of ways and is similar to drying leafy garden herbs. These plants have already been trimmed. In a dark room, buds are placed on screens or hanged. Proper ventilation is needed to remove moisture from the room. Depending on temperature, humidity, ventilation, and the size of buds, it could take anywhere between two and 10 days. Wet buds cannot be sealed without eventually growing molds, unless kept frozen. 
Care needs to be taken when drying buds. They will feel dry on the outside when they are still very wet on the inside. To correct this uneven drying, buds are cured or sweated. To sweat buds, they are placed in a sealed bag or container for several hours. This will redistribute the wetness at the center of the bud evenly throughout the bud. Bud will go into the bag feeling dry and come out feeling wet again. Some growers will alternate between drying and sweating, a full day drying, a half day sweating and so on. When sweating the buds no longer makes them feel wet again, the buds are fully dried and cured. High yield hydroponic systems is divided into three parts. Part one serves as an introduction to hydroponics. In part two, we will learn how to get the most out of an indoor garden. In part three, we will examine the systems used by three different growers. Hydroponics has become an increasingly popular method for growing plants at home, and there is little wonder why. Growers report yield increases of up to 100% when using hydroponics versus growing in soil. Some growers claim more. Buds grow bigger, denser, and faster. And while an efficient system may require some experience and know-how, most hydroponic growth systems are so low maintenance, growers will be growing more and working less compared to traditional methods. Let's take a look at why hydroponic systems work so well. First, consider the needs of roots. In nature, roots need structure, something to actually take hold in. The ground must be firm and deep enough so that roots remain anchored during wind and storms. The plant will also need water, and the nutrients that are dissolved in the water. Thirdly, the roots will need oxygen. This is something many growers overlook. Constantly wet soil or dense, hard-packed soil may limit the amount of oxygen available to roots. Unlike most outdoor growing situations, indoor growers can use the lightest grow mediums available because there is no threat of erosion. Light, fluffy grow mixes are great for plants like marijuana because they allow more oxygen to the roots while still retaining moisture. Hydroponics is even better, providing roots with even more access to oxygen while still maintaining ideal levels of water and nutrients. This enables a speedier uptake of nutrients and faster and bigger growth of plants and buds. Hydroponic systems also give you a higher level of control over plants than what you would have with soil mixes because you can constantly adjust exactly what the nutrient solution contains. However, for the very same reason, hydroponic systems are not as forgiving as soil. Mistakes have a greater impact. Because improper nutrient or pH mixtures could harm plants quickly and severely, greater care and attention is needed. However, most hydroponic systems are simple to use. There are different types of hydroponic systems, and of course all come in different sizes. Each have the same basic features. One, a reservoir for the nutrient solution. Two, a basin for the plant's root system, usually containing grow medium. And three, a feed and return system to cycle the nutrient solution between the basin and reservoir. The reservoir should sit lower than the basin. A pump delivers nutrient-rich water up from the reservoir to the basin, and then the water drains back to the reservoir by force of gravity. 
Some systems use a timer to activate the pump at intervals. Other systems deliver a slow, constant drip. Most systems utilize a medium in which the roots take hold. Any number of medium types can be used. Most are mineral based or special fibers and have no nutritive value. Each have different qualities regarding water drainage, density and so on. Expanded clay pellets, lava rock, and rock wool cubes are common hydroponic grow mediums. Perlite and vermiculite are inappropriate for most hydroponic systems because they are too fine and break down too easy. Different mediums suit different systems. Here we see a basic hydroponic system. Media fills the entire basin. Water is pumped from the reservoir up to dripper lines which feed it to the basin. The basin drains directly back into the reservoir underneath. Depending on the water retention qualities of the particular grow medium used, the pump may be on a timer to run at intervals, or else it may run constantly. Most small pumps are made to fit half-inch PVC tubing. The PVC tubing is prepared with a special tool or a drill to cut appropriately spaced and sized holes in which smaller dripper lines are then fitted. Special fittings keep the connection sealed. Seeds can be planted directly in the basin, but much more commonly, clones or seedlings pre-rooted into rock wool cubes are used. The cube is called the plug. The surrounding media here would be lava rock or clay pellets. The plug is completely buried or placed slightly above the top of the surrounding media. Rather than filling the entire basin with grow medium, a more popular method uses baskets. This allows each plant to be moved or rotated whenever needed. Again, a rock wool cube or plug is half buried in clay pellets, but the pellets are contained within the basket. Roots will grow far beyond the limits of the basket and growers can expect them to eventually become entangled with the roots of other plants nearby, making them less mobile as they grow. Some growers occasionally trim roots that become entangled with the roots of other plants or that clog drain tubes. Both variations of this system could be categorized as top feed systems. Top feed systems are also sometimes called drip systems. The common alternative to top feed systems are called ebb and flow, which is also known as flood and drain. In flood and drain systems, water is made to fill the basin. An overflow drain, which is easily adjusted, controls the flood depth. After a set time, the pump shuts off and the basin drains again. Timers are used to regulate the intervals so that roots won't get too waterlogged or too dried out. The exact intervals will depend on many factors, but generally, a basin will be flooded for about half an hour or so, three or four times a day. Flood and drain systems create a continual soak and dry cycle, which is very healthy for roots. Basins can be in the form of tables or trays, or square or round tubing. With the system shown here, water could be delivered by a series of drippers, with one affixed to the top of each plant. Or it could be made to flow along the bottom of the tube from one end to the other. Basins with flat bottoms are preferred for this method. Some systems are designed to provide an extremely shallow moving film of solution along the inside of a flat basin. Only the root tips are in the water while the rest of the root mass is in the humid air above. This style is called NFT, Nutrient Film Technique. NFT systems are constant flow. The pump never shuts off. NFT systems often do not use grow medium. Instead, plant stalks are lightly clamped at the base and roots are dangled above the nutrient solution. These systems are called water-based as opposed to media-based. Water-based systems are higher risk if any malfunctions or power outages occur. Media-based systems will retain water around the roots for a while in the event of a breakdown, but water-based systems will not, and roots can dry up quickly. 
If you're using a system that requires constant flow, you may want to consider the need for backup in the case of a power outage or pump failure. A generator and a backup pump would be good insurance for any large commercial grower. Small growers are able to deal with system failures by watering plants manually. The water used in a hydroponic system has a carefully controlled amount of fertilizer dissolved into it. This water and fertilizer is called the nutrient solution. Maintaining a solution with the appropriate pH, temperature, and concentration of fertilizers is crucial for the health and rapid growth of plants. Fertilizer overdoses or extreme pH or temperature levels can harm plants quickly in hydroponic systems. After a nutrient solution is created, and as it is cycled through the system, it will change. Chemical fertilizers will often raise the pH of tap water, as can grow mediums as well. Lights may heat up PVC tubing, causing the nutrient solution to rise in temperature. Plants will consume water and nutrients, but at variable rates, meaning the nutrient solution may become more concentrated or more diluted. All of these variables must be monitored and controlled constantly. Getting to know the unique quirks of a specific system usually requires an initial period of frequent monitoring and the occasional adjustment. Well, do you think they're a little bit clogged, maybe? Any serious grower should own meters to accurately monitor the temperature, pH, and parts per million concentration of dissolved salts of the nutrient solution. After a grower becomes familiar with the behavioral characteristics of a particular system, monitoring becomes less intensive. The temperature of the nutrient solution should be kept between 68 and 77 degrees Fahrenheit, or within a few degrees of the air temperature. An inexpensive pool thermometer can be used. Digital thermometers that record minimum and maximum temperatures are even better. If the nutrient solution is too cold, it can be heated with an aquarium heater, or a heating pad can be used on the reservoir. Hot solution can be cooled by passing it through a cooling rad, or by placing coils of hose with cold water running through them into the reservoir. Heat gain can be prevented by insulating and shading buckets and pipes from hot lights. The pH should be kept between 5.9 and 6.3. Inexpensive pool pH test kits can be used. Meters are more convenient, however many inexpensive types are inaccurate. Accurate digital pH meters are best. The concentration of fertilizer in the nutrient solution is expressed as parts per million of dissolved salts. Parts per million, or PPM, is measured by an EC meter. EC stands for electrical conductivity. By testing the electrical conductivity of a liquid, an EC meter can determine the amount of chemical salts dissolved in a liquid. The more conductivity, the more dissolved salts, and thus a higher concentration of fertilizer. A reading of 1250 parts per million, or PPM, means that for every million parts in the nutrient solution, 1250 are dissolved salts. Most hydroponic growers aim to maintain a nutrient solution with a PPM between 700 and 1600. Remember that regular tap water may have a PPM of several hundred before the fertilizer is even mixed in. Most hydroponics retailers will carry either a reputable brand of hydroponic fertilizer or their own brand for which they can suggest an appropriate feeding program. Most hydroponic fertilizers are liquid formulas that come in component parts, usually two or three. Multi-component fertilizers allow the grower to prepare different mixtures for different periods of growth. Most brands will provide such directions on the label. Most growers have a small aquarium pump blowing air through a tube leading to the bottom of the reservoir. This creates many minuscule air bubbles in the water which ultimately provide more oxygen for the roots.
Light, temperature, ventilation, and general maintenance are all important factors that must be considered when planning the design of an efficient hydroponic garden. In order to realize the full potential of hydroponic growing systems, the grower must make sure that these key environmental conditions are controlled. With a carefully designed garden, this control is made easy. Light is probably the most important factor in crop yield potential. More light means more bud. Common household incandescent and halogen lamps are inappropriate for plants. Inexpensive incandescent bulbs marketed as grow lights are also very poor for marijuana. Growers may use fluorescent lights for clones and young seedlings, but using fluorescent light for older plants is not recommended. For vegetative and flowering growth, growers need to use HIDs, high intensity discharge lamps. These lamps may be the largest investment item for the grow room, but quite essential for good yields and quite worth the money spent. Growers use two types of HID, metal halide and high pressure sodium. Both come in various wattages, typically 400, 600 and 1000 watts. The higher the wattage, the more electricity it consumes and the brighter the light is. Experienced hydroponic growers can produce up to two pounds of fully dried marijuana every three to four months for each 1000 watt lamp used. The amount of light to be used should govern the size of the grow room. This chart shows the approximate areas the lamps of different wattages will cover. A 250 watt lamp will cover 5 to 12 square feet, about the area of a small closet. A 400 watt lamp will cover 8 to 20 square feet. A 600 watt lamp will cover 12 to 30 square feet. A 1000 watt lamp will cover 20 to 50 square feet, about half the size of a small bedroom. While a 250 watt lamp is well suited for a small closet, a large full basement could easily utilize several 1000 watt lamps. Of course, the more light provided, the bigger your buds will be. Metal halides emit light similar to that of natural sunlight. This makes them ideal as grow lights. Metal halides are especially good during vegetation. High pressure sodium lamps emit a visibly yellow orangish light. Because this light lacks slightly in the bluish end of the color spectrum, plants vegetated exclusively under high pressure sodiums tend to stretch slightly between branches and appear overly leggy. However, a high pressure sodium lamp will produce about 30% more light than a metal halide of the same wattage. Many growers will mix both types of light. Others use metal halide light for vegetative growth and high pressure sodium for flowering. This emulates the manner in which sunlight becomes increasingly reddish orange towards the end of summer. If you plan to use only one lamp, most growers will recommend a high pressure sodium for its superior lumen output, but either one will do fine on its own. Keep your lights close to your plants. This will ensure the plants receive the most intense bright light. 400 watt lamps can be kept 12 to 18 inches from the plants, whereas 1000 watt lamps should be kept 18 to 30 inches away. Many growers suspend the lamp and reflective hood on an adjustable cord. As plants grow taller, the lamp is simply raised. Use proper reflective plastic on the inside walls of the grow area, or paint them flat white. This, like using a reflective hood, will help save potentially wasted light by reflecting it back onto the plants. Another important element to a successful indoor garden is proper air ventilation. Plants need a constant supply of carbon dioxide rich air. 
Without an air exchange system, CO2 becomes depleted and plants will suffer. Supplemental CO2 can help plants a great deal, but your garden will still require a regular intake of fresh air and removal of stale air. An effective ventilation system will also contain and direct offensive odors, help control temperature, and discourage bugs and disease. If one ventilation fan is used, it should be used as an exhaust fan to suck air out of the room. If two fans are used, use the stronger one for the exhaust and the other for the intake. Intake vents should be close to the floor on one side of the room and exhaust vents near or on the ceiling close to the other side of the room. This is the best way to remove stale air and heat buildup. Various fan types can be used. The CFM rating of a fan will indicate how many cubic feet of air it is able to push per minute. Use a fan rated to push the entire volume of air in your grow room in five minutes or less. Fresh air is vital. However, supplemental CO2 will compensate for poor ventilation and allow plants to grow at higher air temperatures, up to 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Serious growers with large rooms who use carbon dioxide usually must put their ventilation fans on timers. By coordinating the fans to turn off at the same time that CO2 is released, plants can be exposed to boosted levels of CO2 for a set period before the ventilation fans come back on. The exact timing will depend on variables unique to each situation. Creating a system that utilizes supplemental CO2 with optimal results will require some controlled experimentation. Many growers claim larger yields with the use of supplemental CO2. However, some growers see this result because they had poor ventilation to begin with, and the CO2 compensated for that. In these cases, simply increasing the ventilation would achieve the same result. Increasing ventilation can be done by upgrading to a more powerful fan. In addition to intake and outtake airflow, oscillating fans should be placed in the garden in order to blow air directly onto plants to stir leaves and sway stalks. This emulates the natural breeze of the outdoors and performs two main functions. Firstly, the constant pressure of the wind causes the trunks and branches of the plant to become strong and sturdy. This will help immensely in late bloom when the branches are carrying the weight of large dense buds. Secondly, a swift breeze helps keep plants free of dust and bugs. Most bugs are a nuisance to marijuana. Some are devastating. Constant air movement makes an unhappy home for bugs. Proper ventilation should keep the temperature and humidity in check. The relative humidity should stay between 40 and 60 percent. Unless you live in an extremely dry or extremely humid climate, humidity shouldn't be an issue. If it is a problem, simply use a humidifier or dehumidifier. Keep the air temperature in the garden between 70 to 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Mid to high 70s is the best. At night, when the lights go off, it's okay for the temperature to drop 10 or 15 degrees, but not much more. If your lights are causing too much heat buildup, then you need to increase your ventilation or consider the need for an air conditioner. Seeds can be sprouted by planting them an inch deep in moist grow medium, or they can be sprouted in a peat pod, or most appropriately for hydroponics, in rock wool cubes. Use a moisture dome to trap humidity and keep the cube watered. A sprout should emerge in three to four days. A seedling will need two or three weeks, or maybe more, to establish enough roots and leaves so that it can begin to grow rapidly. Clones will usually begin rapid vegetative growth sooner than seedlings. 
Growers will decide on the length of the veg cycle based on how large they want their plants to grow. Some growers like to keep the cycle short. Others prefer to wait longer and grow their plants larger. Different hydroponic systems will suit different plant sizes. A short veg period is one or two weeks. A long veg period is four or more weeks. After vegetation, plants will bud. Budding lasts roughly two months for most indican varieties. During this time, the plant consumes less and less nitrogen and more and more phosphorus. When buds mature, THC levels will peak and then soon drop off again. From seed to harvest, the plant life cycle should be about 100 days or 3 to 4 months. Many serious growers will have two separate grow rooms, one for vegging and one for budding. After plants are done vegging, they are moved to the bud room and a second batch is started in the veg room again. This system creates a more continual harvest. Bud rooms are larger than veg rooms to accommodate the increase in plant size. As well, many growers will use metal halide light in the veg room and high pressure sodium in the bud room. Plants will utilize two to three times more light in late bud than during vegetation. Marijuana is dioecious. That means there are both males and females. When in bud, the male plant produces pollen. When this pollen comes in contact with the female, the female becomes pollinated and then produces seeds from the DNA of each parent. As all growers know, only the female plant produces the sought after buds high in THC. Furthermore, these female buds are far, far better if they remain unpollinated by the males. The grower has two choices in how to deal with this challenge. One way is to remove males when they appear. If each plant can be thoroughly inspected at least once every two or three days during the onset of budding, this is easy enough. However, by this time, these well-developed plants have used up valuable time and grow space. A second way, preferred by more serious growers, is to use clones. A clone is a clipping taken from a well-established plant. The clipping will have the same genes as the parent plant. Taking clippings from a female plant will guarantee that all clippings are female. A grower could either take several clones from one designated mother plant that remains forever in veg, or else take one or two clippings of each plant from a group of plants that are about to be forced to bud. Either way, it must be known that the source of the clone is in fact a female plant. A problem arises, however, because a clone must only be taken from a plant before it flowers, and yet we can't know that a plant is female until after it flowers. There are two ways to deal with this inconvenience. One way to determine whether a plant is female is to force it into bud until its sex shows, and then quickly revert it back to the vegetative stage. A budding plant will slowly revert back to vegetation if put back into a long light cycle. However, changing the photo period from vegetative to budding and then back to veg again will place undue stress on a plant. A better method is to take a clone from the plant in question and force the clone to bud until it shows its sex. The parent plant will be the same sex as the clone. The clone is good for little else and can be thrown away. Wally has a small veg room and a small bud room, both in a loft area of his urban studio apartment. The veg area is about 4 feet long by 2 feet wide, and 2 feet high and lit with two 40 watt fluorescent bulbs that shut off for 6 hours at night. 
There is a steady, gentle draft pulling fresh air into the room for the young clones and mother plants kept here. The fluorescent light is angled for small plants at one end and larger plants at the other. The flowering area is slightly bigger, five feet long by four feet wide and four feet high. This area is lit by a 400 watt high pressure sodium lamp and a 400 watt metal halide. Thin boards covered with reflective material are angled on each side of the lights to reflect light downward. A fan rated at 200 CFMs constantly draws air from this room, directing it out his fourth story window. Because the fan is relatively powerful for such a small room, the odor can never be detected in his apartment, only in the garden itself or outside his window. If he had neighbors, he would probably need to use a filter to kill the smell. Wally grows his plants small and is constantly taking clones and harvesting plants. Here we see 10 day old clones on the left and month old clones on the right. The older plants on the right will soon be moved to the flowering area, but will first have one or two clones taken from each of them. The same will eventually be done with the small clones on the left. Wally will take a clone of a clone of a clone, but prefers not to clone further than about three generations. Every few months, Wally will grow from seed. Wally wants to upgrade to a flood and drain table, but for now uses a very basic hydroponic system. Unlike most systems, the nutrient solution is not cycled back and forth from a reservoir, but rather remains in a tray where the roots grow. Rock wool cubes held by clay pellets sit in baskets in the tray. Roots are partially submerged in the nutrient solution, which is kept about an inch and a half deep. Bubblers are used to oxygenate the solution, which is topped up daily. Wally's system works well and requires relatively little investment. However, without a separate reservoir for the nutrient solution, there is no soak and dry cycle that roots enjoy so much. Wally has had different variations of the same basic system, usually utilizing different things for use as trays. In attempts to combat the fast growth of algae in the trays, Wally placed covers over them to protect the nutrient solution from the light. Because green algae is caused by the light, the more concealed the nutrient solution, the slower the algae will grow. However, this white lid did very little to block the light and Wally decided he prefers the open tray to the covered one because with the cover, plants can't be moved around as easily. Wally doesn't own an EC meter. He borrowed a friend's and used it once to measure how much fertilizer per gallon of water it takes to achieve 1200 parts per million. Without an EC meter, Wally can't monitor the solution and so he changes it often. He uses an A and B liquid chemical fertilizer prepared by a local hydroponics store. A and B formulas allow the grower to use different mix ratios to emphasize different primary nutrients during different stages of growth. Wally averages about a half a pound of fully dried marijuana every three or four months. He used to have trouble cloning. His clones would usually die within about a week. Now he has a 100% survival rate. He says this is because he no longer takes clippings from young thin branches, but only from thick mature ones. He uses a razor blade and plenty of rooting gel. Here is his method. First he covers the razor edge with rooting hormone. He chooses a sturdy branch and cuts halfway between two sets of branch nodes. The cut is made on an angle so there is more surface area where the stem has been cut, allowing more roots to grow out. Extra leaves and branches are cut off so that it is a long stem. Rooting hormone is dripped into the rock wool cube as the clone is inserted. The cube is gently squeezed to get rid of air pockets.
Wally keeps them in a tray with an inch of water, in a moisture dome, under fluorescent light. They are misted daily. This one here is two weeks old. This one here less than one week. Gibson's room is on the top floor of a house he rents in the country. The room is 15 feet long by 8 feet wide and has a conveniently beveled roof, perfect for reflecting light downward. The room is shared by multiple drip systems. On one half of the room are two sets of round gully systems. And on the other half, two drip tables. The two round gully systems are made from 8 inch diameter white plastic pipe. In each pipe there are 10 plants, and on each system 5 pipes for a total of 10 pipes and 100 plants. Both sets of 5 pipes have their own reservoir, from where the nutrient solution is pumped through half inch black PVC tubing. The PVC tubing branches out, with each branch feeding 10 drip lines. Each plant has a dripper clamped at its base to feed it water. The five white pipes are connected at one end where they drain the solution back into the reservoir. The pipes are graduated in height on a 45 degree angle. With both systems facing each other this creates a stadium effect. This allows more plants to be close to the lights. Rather than being supported from underneath, the light plastic pipes are suspended from the ceiling by wire. Gibson uses clones which are grown in rock wool cubes in a closet under fluorescent light. After roots can be seen growing from the bottoms of the cubes, they are moved to the hydroponic system. The clones seen here are six weeks old and almost two weeks into bud. They will be harvested in five to six weeks. Here they are about 12 to 14 inches tall and will grow another six inches by harvest. Each rock wool plug has plastic wrapped around its sides and is shielded by a piece of mylar on top. This is to prevent light from finding the roots or the nutrient solution. Gibb added the mylar collars after he found that the nutrient solution was turning green from algae caused by the light. Gibb runs the pumps for an hour or so, and then has them shut off for a couple of hours. Occasionally he will leave them off for three or four hours to let the roots dry out a little more than usual, but not much longer, and not when the lights are on, or else plants will dry out too much. Roots will eventually grow all up and down the insides of the white pipes. Gibb keeps the water level in his reservoirs low, at the same level as the pump's water intake. This causes the pump to mix air bubbles with the water as it travels through the PVC line. More oxygen in the water is better for the roots. On the other side of the room are two 4x8 tables, each with 7x8 rows of plants, for a total of 112 plants. The two tables are each made from a sheet of plywood framed with 2x6. Thick black plastic lines the inside bottom of the tables and at one end each table has a drain. A sheet of mylar with an X cutout for each plant lines the top. Like the tube system, clones rooted in rock wool cubes are used. These small cubes are plugged into a larger rock wool cube, which is placed on a larger rock wool platform that stays hidden underneath. Roots quickly grow into the lower platform and outward into neighboring platforms. Gaps between each platform create a large grid for easy water drainage. 
Each reservoir has a pump attached to half inch PVC tubing that branches out and feeds drip line. There is a dripper line affixed to the base of each plant. The tables are angled just slightly so the nutrient solution returns to one end where it drains back into the reservoir. Timers run the pumps for an hour, three to four times a day. This system does not need to pump water as frequently as the round gully system because the large rock wool platforms retain a lot of water for a long time. On this system, the pump could be off for a day or more before plants began to dry up. Gibb keeps the nutrient levels at about 1400 parts per million. At this stage, Gibb uses two 1000 watt metal halide lamps and two 1000 watt high pressure sodium lamps. Now that budding has commenced, he will install three more high pressure sodium lamps. Gibb always increases his light for budding. He usually uses reflective hoods when he's growing such small plants because all of the light should be directed straight down. But this time he is taking advantage of the beveled roof shape, so he doesn't feel the need for reflective hoods. Using mylar everywhere helps maximize reflection and keeps light out of the nutrient solution. Gibb is careful not to expose budding plants to any light during daily 12 hour dark periods. This can cause them to revert back to vegetation. If he does need to check the system during a dark period, he uses a single green colored light bulb to see by. The green light will not disturb the plants. With a few hooks mounted in the ceiling, some bungee cord and duct tape, Gibb has positioned two squirrel cage fans near the ceiling out of the way. One fan brings air into the room, the other pushes air out. The intake fan brings in air from a nearby window and blows it down through two short ducts onto the plants. The exhaust fan directs air into the attic but passes through an ozone generator on the way. Each fan has a 250 CFM rating. This is plenty of power to keep the room well ventilated. Two oscillating fans blow air at the plants. None of the fans in the room ever shut off. Gibb prefers to grow small plants because the cycle is shorter and he harvests more crops per year than growing plants large. In this room there is a total of 212 plants. Gibb grows about 6 to 8 pounds every 3 months. That averages out to around a half ounce per plant. Jay's garden is built in the basement of his sister's house in the suburbs. Together they built a room within the basement room with its own subfloor ceiling and walls. The ceilings and walls are drywalled and fully insulated. A snug fitted sliding door keeps in light, odor and sound. The inside of the room is 30 feet long by 8.5 feet wide and 6.5 feet high and is lined with white reflective plastic. Nine lights, each 1,000 watts, are affixed to the ceiling in a straight line. The ceiling is beveled at a 45 degree angle so that sideways light is reflected downward. Fourteen plants are lined up in two rows of seven. At each far end, two fans are mounted on the wall and three sit on the floor for a total of ten fans. Plus three more for the intake and outtake ducts. There are intakes at both ends of the room designed to direct fresh air to the floor and a single exhaust vent in the center of the ceiling with ducting 30 feet up to and through the roof. In early veg, Jay uses only five or six lights, usually all metal halide. As bud time comes closer, he adds high pressure sodium lamps one at a time so that by the time the plants are shifted into bud, all nine light sockets are being used. Jay doesn't use reflective hoods, but because the lamps are mounted at ceiling level and the ceiling is beveled, little light is wasted. Jay grows his plants big. 
There are less than two plants for each light in his room. Jay prefers to grow plants large because although it takes longer, he is able to get more bud per light. When the plants are mature, the cola buds are huge. Each plant will yield over a pound. The plants are spaced about four feet from each other and should just be touching the ceiling at six feet high at harvest time. Jay calls this method the bucket system. In this media-based top feed system, each plant has its own bucket filled with grow medium, which is connected to a common reservoir full of nutrient solution. A submersible pump pumps solution through half-inch PVC hose, which lead to drip lines at the top of each bucket. The solution pours through the grow medium, is captured in the bucket, and is then returned to the reservoir. The pump runs only when the lights are on, so for 6 hours a day during veg and 12 hours a day during bud, no water runs. Each container is actually a bucket within a bucket. A three gallon bucket with holes drilled through the bottom holds the grow medium and the root mass. This is all housed in a larger five gallon bucket which is affixed with a drain pipe on the bottom where water drains back to a reservoir large enough for 40 gallons. Yo. The grow medium is stratified into two layers. On the top are clay pellets, on the bottom lava rock. A rooted clone is placed flush with the top of the clay pellets, or deeper if the clone has a tall stem. A five foot stake in each bucket will allow Jay to encourage each plant to grow straight up. The upper layer of clay pellets mostly provides for drainage and aeration. Roots grow straight down in this stuff. The lower layer of lava rock retains a great deal more water and the roots eventually envelop it. Some growers will use only clay pellets, but Jay finds his method better. When only clay pellets are used, roots charge straight down and tend to clog the bucket to the point where they need to be cut back. Using a layer of lava rock minimizes this problem. Nonetheless, it is common for Jay to have to trim roots once or twice near harvest so they won't clog up drain pipes. The pump runs only when the lights are on. The buckets retain a shallow pool of nutrient solution at the bottom so that roots have a little moisture even when the pump is shut off. Here Jay demonstrates how easily his plants can be rotated. Jay uses a three-part liquid chemical fertilizer called General Hydroponics. General Hydroponics can be mixed in different ratios to achieve different nutritional balances. Jay has used the same exact program for nearly 10 years. Micro, Grow and Bloom are the three component parts of the General Hydroponics brand fertilizer used by Jay. Jay emphasizes the Grow component during vegetative growth and the Bloom component during flowering. These numbers represent how many milliliters of Micro, Grow and Bloom he uses per gallon of water for each of three phases. During vegetation, a mixture of 10 milliliters of micro, 15 milliliters of grow, and 5 milliliters of bloom are mixed, according to directions, into each gallon of water used. When budding is induced, the mixture is changed to 8 milliliters of micro, 7 milliliters of grow, and 15 milliliters of bloom for each gallon of water. Halfway into budding, or four weeks before harvest, the mixture is changed again to 5 milliliters of micro, 1 milliliter of grow, and 24 milliliters of bloom. As you can see, from veg to late bloom, the amount of grow decreases greatly while the amount of bloom increases greatly. Each formula uses 30 milliliters of solution in total for each gallon of water. This achieves a ppm of dissolved salts in the nutrient solution of about 1500. Every four days, the system is completely drained and flushed, and fresh solution is made. After adding the solution, Jay waits an hour and then checks the pH. Anywhere between 5.9 and 6.2 is good. If the pH is outside of this range, pH adjuster is added. 
During the first week that the plants are in the system, Jay uses a nutritional additive that helps stimulate root growth in new clones and transplants. Such nutritional additives are easy to find in grocery stores. During the last 10 days before harvest, no fertilizer is used, only pure water. This gets rid of any residual fertilizer compounds in the plants that may affect the burning qualities of the fully dried bud. During the first month or so, Jay used an ozone generator to minimize detectable odors. The ozone generator, which sat outside of the room, delivered a constant flow of ozonated air through a short tube into the grow room, right below the exhaust vent. This ozonated air would then get sucked into the exhaust vent, where it would mix with air being sucked from the room. It was hoped that the odor-filled air and the ozone could mix together as they traveled up the duct, sufficiently enough that this would minimize the smell. Without knowing for sure if this setup would be effective when plants became more pungent, Jay eventually decided to invest in a large carbon filter. Carbon filters are simple and effective. Although it costs Jay over $500 to purchase this large one, he recommends them over any other filter device when it comes to getting rid of odors. Smaller versions are in the $200 range. When he installed it, he simply extended the exhaust ducting in the exhaust fan down a few extra feet right into the room. The fan actually mounts right on top of the filter, which stands in the middle of the grow room. All of the outgoing air must now pass through the filter. Regular maintenance of Jay's room consists mostly of adjusting and changing the nutrient solution, as well as removing dead leaves from the plants and off the floor. Leaf picking must be done increasingly often as plants grow more and more foliage. Eventually the only open space to get around the room is along the floor. Jay prunes the plants as they grow to maximize yields. When the plants are grown as large as they are in this system, there is a great deal of foliage and branch growth near the bottoms of plants that will ultimately yield little product. Much of the plant's energy is used up developing minuscule buds that will be of relatively low quality. By removing these energy suckers, other buds will grow larger. Removing this undergrowth will also facilitate better aeration and reduce the risk of bugs in the common blight disease. Tying branches also helps maximize yields. Jay uses nylon ribbon because cotton string retains moisture and can cause mold growth. At first, lower branches are tied down. This exposes bud sites to more direct light. Later, when large cola buds develop, the weight of the buds is too much for the angled branch to hold, so the same branches that were once tied down now need to be tied up. Such a large room requires daily monitoring to keep everything in check and to deal with any surprises. Every garden will come with its own host of challenges. Jay quickly learned that his reservoir water was heating up to unhealthy temperatures as a result of the black tubing and black buckets under the bright lights. Jay placed insulated reflective sleeves around each bucket and this brought the temperature of the solution down. He was also able to cool the solution down further by surrounding the reservoir with cold water. This was easy because the reservoir sits in a sealed hole cut from the basement floor. Jay says that these plants were vegged for too long. This bud shouldn't be wrenched against the ceiling like that. He figures he will lose some crop potential due to that mistake, but not too much. What do you think, 15? Other systems Jay had also had tidy reservoirs dug from the basement floor. To build them, Jay had to jackhammer through the cement and then dig out enough area to fit three 50 gallon drums. Cement was then poured around the drums and the floor was sealed with thick enamel paint. In another garden built by Jay, he wasn't able to place the reservoir below floor level so instead he had to raise the plant buckets. Having the reservoir under floor level is much easier than having to raise every plant. Jay harvests the entire room all at once and with the help of five or six friends, takes almost a whole day. Yeah. 
Buds are trimmed and placed on screens in a dark room that is warm and ventilated. After two days, they are sweated in plastic bags for half a day, and then placed back on the screens. Sweating is repeated once or twice more until buds are completely dried and won't sweat anymore. From the time Jay takes his clones to the day of harvest is about 14 weeks, or just under 100 days. This time around he was expecting about 16 pounds, but grew just under 14. This works out to over 15 ounces of dried product per plant, or about a pound and a half for each 1000 watt lamp. Using this system, Jay has achieved yields of almost 2 pounds of dried bud for each 1000 watt lamp used. <laughs> 